This is the Best Friends Podcast, dedicated to sharing the people and programs that are ending the killing of cats and dogs in America's animal shelters. You'll hear from animal welfare leaders from across the movement who will share the innovative and collaborative work that are creating life-saving successes in communities of all sizes. Today is Thursday, April 16th, and it is National Animal Care and Control Appreciation Week. I'm John Dunn, and I'd like to take the time with you to appreciate this incredibly important element of our work to save lives. I'm a little bit of the uh, the optimist, John. I, I, I think we're going to come out of this stronger. I think we are going to come out of this realizing that we're all in this together. That's the president of the National Animal Care and Control Association, Scott Giacopo. So what is happening with these departments across the country right now? I think we'd all agree that this is a truly essential service, so they can't just stop working. How has the work shifted, and what might happen going forward? Before we get to my chat with Scott, I saw this on Facebook yesterday, and I just wanted to share it, because I think we can all use more good news. So this is it. This is our empty kennel here at Palm Beach County Animal Care and Control. That's the staff at Palm Beach County Animal Care and Control in Florida, where they are celebrating emptying one entire kennel at their facility for the first time ever since the agency was created in 1969. We know this is not the only community kicking some butt, and maybe yours is one of them. Send us an email, podcast at bestfriends.org. That's podcast at bestfriends.org. I want to know what is happening where you live. And don't forget, check out the website, bestfriends.org slash podcast. You'll find all of the episodes and the resources from them, and you'll find links to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. That's bestfriends.org slash podcast. Now, I want to take you to the front lines. Baytown, Texas. It's part of the Houston metro area. It's a community of just over 75,000 people. It's a very small community, um, so people know each other. You can literally walk down the street and there are family members, like literally two houses down. So yeah, animal services is essential today and every day. Officers all across the country are out doing what needs to be done. Stephanie Ramiro is an animal control specialist at the Baytown Animal Control and Adoption Center. Whenever I heard about it, at first, I'm not going to lie to you, I was like everybody else. I was just like, oh, it's not here because at first it was in China. And then when it started coming over here, it's when everything like it went from one day to another that literally everybody's lives changed. We wanted to hear what it's like for an officer out there on the front lines during this COVID-19 pandemic. It is very scary. I do have a father and a mother that have very bad heart problems and other health problems. And so it's scary, you know, like, and then having me going out in the field sometimes, and I don't know if I caught anything from just going out in the field, you know. Stephanie sets aside those fears and continues to put herself out there on the road to keep doing her job. We're only doing certain calls like we're doing emergency calls and then if there is a call that needs to be ran then we go to those ones as well like livestock there's always livestock getting out (laughs) what we're trying to do is that we're trying to make sure that we do it all via phone so that we're not having to go out but there's times where people are like oh no that's not my cow and so we're trying to have to we have to go out there to figure out whose animal it actually belongs to go ahead can you respond to 19? I had a call where uh, there was a bike case, right? Hi. I'm Officer Rudo based on animal control. And I was talking to the person, and her whole family was there around me. Back in the day, like literally just a month ago, that was basically the normal. And I literally had to tell them, you know, I'm sorry, but can you give me some space? It does have to be six feet. I need to make sure that I'm safe and you guys are safe. For this lady, she was she was inside of her home, and she didn't want to get out because she was scared. But back then, you would have been like, oh, you know, she's standoffish, she doesn't want to interact with me. But now it's like, this is what you prefer. I prefer the non-normal now. <laughs> Thank you, have a good day. To be honest, it's I know that it's something that still has to be done to be going out there. I know that in no way am I upset about it. 582 to 6. Go ahead. I want people to know that, you know, even if I'm out here putting myself in danger, not like, I know that sounds crazy because like, that's weird. That's, that's something weird to say, (laughs) but like, I want people to know that like, I'm still going to be here. I'm still going to be able to help you out. For instance, we're giving people food who cannot go to the store. 
Like, we're giving them dog food or cat food and even cat litter if they need it. You know, whatever they need, we're trying to help them out so that they're not putting themselves at risk as well. So I want them to know that we're here for them regardless of what the weather is, what the diseases are, or whatever is going on. We're going to be here to help them out. That remarkable individual is Stephanie Ramiro in Texas, the Baytown Animal Control and Adoption Center. It would be difficult to find a more fitting person to talk to about field services during National Animal Care and Control Appreciation Week than Scott Giacopo. He's been involved in animal control his entire life, and he's very old, so he's a true expert. No, I'm kidding. Scott's a friend, but I do think it would be better if you didn't tell him I said that. Uh, but I don't really want to talk about animal control stuff at all. I've just completely uh, brought you here under false pretenses to talk about Tom Brady. Oh, the, the, hey, let's have at it. <laughs> the greatest quarter. I don't know if you can see, but right there is my little Tom Brady statue. <laughs> is he wearing a Tampa Bay jersey? No. That's fake news, John. That's fake news. <laughs> he's he's going to be at training camp as soon as they open Keep it. Keep hoping that hope, I guess. <laughs> All right, that's enough sports for now. Uh, Scott, you're a colleague of mine here at Best Friends. Uh, you work with animal control departments, shelters all across the country, helping them to implement life-saving programs, right? And I also know you're the president of the National Animal Care and Control Association, which is better known in our industry as NACA, for those who may not know. But what is NACA and what role does NACA play? NACA is the National Animal Care and Control Association, and it's basically the only, I, I hate using the phrase trade association, but it's, 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 it's made up, it's a volunteer, it's a volunteer position on the board. Um, I currently serve as the president, uh, and uh, we, we have a board of, of, of leaders throughout the country that come together and, and help, help promote animal control as a profession. Uh, we offer training classes, we offer um, resources, we offer networking, we have an annual conference. We and, and when COVID hit, that's when we realized the importance of our role and we started issuing recommendations on how um, how animal control could could deal with the situation as best they could to maintain a not only a level of safety for themselves but also safety for the community and and still provide that level of public public safety that is needed uh, is an obligation to animal control. I talked with Stephanie Ramiro. She's an officer down in Baytown, Texas, and you know she's still out there every day. And she said that the types of calls that she's responding to. They've changed. So it's more of a, you know, an emergency based situation, but she's still out there. She still has to interact with the public. And, you know, Scott, I don't know what your life is like right now, but I just have no interest in leaving the house. And quite frankly, you know, it's a terrifying proposition. I don't want to get sick. I am incredibly lucky that I am able to do that, but so many in our field are not. It is an essential service. And again, that obviously includes animal control officers. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, I've been out of the field, um, for about three years now, um, at, at least. And, you know, it, I, I get, I get the itch to get back out there. Um, but I feel for those officers because, you know, I mean, and, and not to the extent they have to deal with now, but, you know, I mean, I've, I've had to go out during blizzards, you know, coming from new England and going out in, 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 you know, harsh weather and all that. And a lot of people don't realize that being an animal control officer, Officer is a risky job. I mean, you take your your personal safety at, at, at hand every time you leave the house. You know, we've lost in in the past couple several years, we've lost three officers in the line of duty. You know, to, to to getting shot and killed, and you know, there've been hostages. We had one not too long ago where an officer was held at gunpoint. Um, in, in Florida, where, you know, the, the SWAT team had to come down and defuse the situation and, you know, and all that and all that stuff. So on, on a daily basis, we understand the risks that we take when we go out into the field. But COVID brings a whole new level. You know, it's a whole new level of not only are you risking your own safety in that regard, but now you're risking bringing something home to your family. You know, we did a poll on 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 Facebook, uh, on NACA data on Facebook, asking what officers were afraid of. And that was one of the biggest things was bringing things home to their family. You know, and, and again, I think that's part of what unites us is that there's no one, no one anywhere can hide from this. 
we're all facing the same thing. When we leave our house, we are all risking our safety today. Not knocking on a violent offender's door, which is, I mean, that still exists. But we are all risking our safety and our family safety by doing this. And that's why NACA takes it so seriously when we when we issue the statements on, um, you know, what to do and how to do it. Uh, it's because of our genuine concern for the, those animal, those animal control officers well-being and their mental well-being. I mean, it's psychologically, a, a, you know, difficult for you to go out and knock on these doors, even if you know it's not a violent offender. You don't know if the person beyond the, at the other door is, is carrying something that could kill you or your family members. I was thinking about this earlier, which is, you know, the knowledge we have of COVID-19 is still, still seems pretty thin, you know, particularly when it comes to transmission and incubation. I don't know, maybe it's updated since I uh, last knew, but they're saying you can have it for two weeks potentially and be asymptomatic. So, you know, that just adds to that fear. I mean, who knows when you may have interacted with someone, it's such a long period of time. It's just very scary stuff. Uh, you mentioned NACA and that work. So tell me what's been happening with that. Yeah. Uh, well, one of the first things we did was we we issued a, a letter to all of the governors across the country um, requesting that we uh, that animal control be included in essential services. We wanted to make sure that there was um, the ability for the officers to do it, um, and 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 but also to to make it so that we were only required to respond to emergency calls. You know, I mean, on any given day, an animal control officer will get a call about, you know, someone's complaining that there's a cat in their yard. Um, and, and, you know, some officers still respond to that, you know, and they'll go out and they'll talk to the neighbors. Hey, do you know who owns this cat or who's caring for this cat? And, you know, they'll try and work with the, work with the, the resident to, um, you know, use deterrence to keep the cat out of the yard and find out what's going on and, and so forth. And, and, or, or we'll get calls about barking dogs, you know, and we'll go out and we'll, we'll see, make sure the dog's okay. And, you know, and all that, um, those are, are, are non emergency calls that really puts the officer's life in danger. And, 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 it, and, and it sounds silly to say, but, you know, now if you go out and you're talking to neighbors, again, you don't know what you're going to run into or who you're going to run out into out there that may, may give you the, the virus. So, so what we decided was, you know, we, we wanted to make it so that, you know, uh, uh, we were recommending animal control only respond to emergency calls if an animal's sick or injured or is causing a public safety threat. And and I had an interesting conversation with an officer about that. It's like, well, what's the difference, you know, if a dog is just running down the street, right? Um, should we be responding to that? I said, okay, well, you know, what you want to do is you want your dispatcher to look at what's the dog doing? Is he, is he running down the street, you know, looking over his shoulder, looking lost, and he's staying like on the sidewalk. It's not a busy metropolitan area. You know, like I live in a relatively suburban neighborhood. Um, streets aren't busy. You know, if, if the dog's crossing the street, it's not a big deal, you know. But if, if the dog is, you know, chasing people, um, then, then there's a problem there. That's a, that's a threat to public safety and an officer should respond. Or if the dog is zigzagging out of a, out of traffic on a busy, busy throughway, you know, busy street, um, then that's going to create a public safety threat. So those are the types of things that you need to establish before you dispatch an officer out. But if it's just a dog running down the street, a historically, we know John, that the majority of what, what we refer to as uh, running at large, RAL calls, animal control loves to use acronyms, RALs. So the majority of running at large calls, by the time the officer gets there, the dog's long gone anyway, right? And the dog's probably at home. You know, most of them are going to are going to run, end up running home and get back into the yard, or their or their person is, you know, comes out and finds that the the gate's open, the dog's gone. They start running up and down the street, calling the dog's name. Dog comes back. By the time the officer actually gets there, it's gone. So to so to have an officer get into their truck, go out into the community, start talking to people on on a in a situation where they're more likely to not find anything anyway. It, it's not only a waste of time, but it's putting that in, that 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 officer at risk. One of the things I think uh, that we're seeing across everything we do is we have to shift these policies, right? And maybe 
some of these things that we were doing before because we'd always done them or there was an expectation that we did them or we thought it was the right thing to do. And then maybe we realize, hey, this is better. Right. It's better if we do it this way, right? Yeah. And I, I'm interested yeah. if you think that calls like an RAL, look at me picking up the lingo, there you go. Uh, <laughs> calls like an RAL, maybe we don't do those anymore. Yeah, you know, John, and I've, I, I'm a firm believer in that, and especially when you know when we when we're able to look at data, you know, to me, that you know, data driven driven decisions are key to what we should and shouldn't be doing half the time. And I think it was uh, in 2000, uh, I think it was either 15 or 15, 14 or 15 when I did this in DC, um, we had responded to uh, just over 2,000 dog running at large calls. And, and, and we had, I had run the data and the, another acronym for you, GOA, gone on arrival. Um, we, were, we were able to look at that. 87% were gone on arrival. So in, in, in here, if you look at what, what it costs a taxpayer for one, you know, to send me out there all those times, it costs a, a, a ton of money of tax dollars. And it's a waste of time when, when my officers and I could have been focusing on a, a, a more in-depth dog bite investigation or, or a cruelty investigation. Every, office, every animal control agency that I've worked with across the country, and that, in my role with best friends, that's what I do. I go all over the country working with animal control agencies. Almost every single one of them, they're understaffed. And, 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 and what an officer's job basically is, is they get their call log in the morning and they look at it and they go, geez, how am I going to get up to all these calls today? And they start cranking out calls. They start clearing calls. They'll run out. They'll, they'll do, you know, they'll do what they need to do to get, to get that, get to the next call. Um, and, and they don't have time. And, and, and when you start looking at some of those, um, uh, non-essential calls, I should say, uh, uh, you know, I, I usually have a different term for it. It's BS calls. That's an official acronym, I assume. It is. It is. You know, I, I think that's world known too, you know, um, but those calls that we're not mandated, legally mandated, required to do, um, that we just do them. And, and, you know, when we, when, when we're able to look at, 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 at what those calls are and if we can take them out and not do them anymore, then the officers then have a enough time to fully address, you know, uh, uh, problem solving at each call. And they also get to do more community engagement and, and interact with the community on a, on a personal level. You know, I wanted the community to meet Officer Scott, not Chief Giacobo. You know what I mean? I'm just, I'm a guy who, who, who cares about the community, cares about animals, cares about people. Let's work together on solving this problem. But if I'm running around trying to clear calls, I'm not going to have time to do that. What are some of the other um, policies or things that NACA has worked on that you've worked on with NACA uh, in terms of the recommendations for policies during this time? One of the, one of the ones we, and again, we sent, we, we sent this out to all, all, all governors across the country is there are states where um, if a dog or, or cat bites or scratches someone that they have to be impounded and held for 10 days. And there are most states will will allow for the at officer's discretion to do a home quarantine to make sure that that dog's safe. You know, he's coming on his rabies vaccination. He, he can stay in the house. He doesn't need to be impounded. But what's happening is in some of those states, and the, and the reason we wrote this is because we heard from some of the officers in these states where they said, hey, you know, I need help with, with get, getting my, my government to allow for, for home quarantines. Um, so that was one of the big ones we put out there. And, you know, a lot of what we're doing is, is designed not only for officer safety, but it's also designed to reduce the numbers of animals coming into shelters. And, and, you know, we have seen in the community come out in droves, adopting and fostering animals. Um, there's so many empty shelters out there, which is fantastic. I mean, it's heartwarming to see the, 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 the amount of community support that we've had. And, and, and people say, well, what's the big deal then? You know, there's, there's empty cages. Let's, let's fill them back up, you know, and, 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 and our, our, our goal is not to do that. Um, and our goal is to keep those animals in the homes where they belong and, and, and so forth. But one of the things we have to do is we have to prepare for what might lie ahead. And, and, and we talk about disaster preparedness all the time and, you know, and all that. We don't know the, the ultimate 
the ultimate fallout of, of what's happening in our country right now. Millions upon millions of people are filing for unemployment or lost their job. Is there going to be an explosion in lost housing soon? You know, are these people going to lose their housing? You know, uh, uh, this tens of thousands of people have died already because of this virus. Many more that I can't even, I, I don't even have an estimate to tell you are hospitalized in intensive care. Statistically, you know, more than half those people have pets. Where are those pets going to end up? So one of the things we need to prepare for is a massive influx of animals coming into the shelter. And, and, and if we don't have space for it, we're going to end up result we're going to end up resorting to having to euthanize animals for space again. Um, and that's just, you know, that's what we're, we're all trying to avoid. We're all trying to avoid, you know, getting, getting to that point. So the more, the more space we can have in our shelter for, for the animals that have no other alternative, the better off we are. And if officers are going out and, and, and just picking up a nuisance cat now, you know, uh, here's one of the things I was dealing with, a, with an officer, a director of an, uh, field services in Florida. And he said that he was still going out and picking up nuisance cats because the community was complaining about it during this time or before COVID during this time, the other day. Right. So I said, you what are you doing with these cats? Because non-essential surgery is stopped in most places because they, the states want the PPE sent to the, the healthcare workers and so forth, which is you know understandable and all that. But in most places, sterilization has stopped. These cats are just being housed and they're not adoptable. They can't be sterilized and released. But the officers are like, well, that's my job is to pick. You know, when someone complains about the cat, I go get it. That's what I've always done. So you have to stop doing that. You know, and, and, and now we're at a point where do we release those cats unsterilized, which nobody wants to do, but is it better than being dead or sitting in a cage indefinitely? So these are the types of struggles that we're dealing with. And, and it was actually another, another statement that we released and talked about was a lot of states require before you release an animal, it's sterilized. In fact, most, most states require sterilization before the animal is released. And, and now with sterilization stopping, if for the most part, those shelters are, are in a position where they might not be able to adopt out those animals. So again, we wrote letters to the governors and municipalities pleading with them to relax that that law during this time. Uh, on this podcast, Scott, we're always going to be talking a lot about this consistent thread that we're seeing right now. You know, this predicament I think we're in is pushing us to think differently, whether we want to or not. And it's getting us out of this kind of what we've always done mentality. Yeah. And that hopefully means a lot of good changes. And there's a lot of communities. I mean, let's be honest. There's a lot of communities that still are laggards, I guess, if that's what you want to say, in terms of getting on board with programs we know that save lives. And so I think we're just going to we're just going to see communities have to do it. When I talked with Stephanie, I loved hearing how they are helping the community right now and not just with, you know, bad animal issues, but just helping people. Right. So what do you need? Do you need pet food? Do you need litter? Uh, can we walk your dog? <laughs> Whatever it is, we're going to help you keep your pet. Yeah. And that's just a huge amount of respect for the human animal bond. And I ultimately, I think, of course, reduces the number of animals surrendered. So it's just good practice. And I hope, and I believe that these approaches won't go away as things get back to, you know, quote unquote normal, whatever that might be, you know, it's just going to push us. I think it's got to be better. Yeah. And, and more effective. Now, don't get me wrong, John, there are a number of agencies out there that what they're doing today is really no different than what they were doing six months ago. You know, they've always done it this way and not always, but they, they've already moved to that to that new model of animal ser uh, field services, so to speak. Uh, and, and there are a lot that have been reluctant uh, or resistant to that that transformation, that change, um, who are now being forced into it. And hopefully they will see, wow, this is working and it is better. You know, like let's take, you know, picking up nuisance cats, for instance, you know, um, for decades. And, th and this is something when I, when I, when I teach animal control officers, I, 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 I keep saying this over and over again, because I can't, I can, I have difficulty wrapping my head around why anyone would still do it. We have seen, 
time and time again that removing a cat from an area doesn't work. It's proven. We have been trying it for decades. In 1929, there was a law passed in Washington, D.C. that mandated animal control pick up and destroy all cats found running at large. Okay, roaming at large. And in 2007, when I showed up, we were still doing it by the truckloads. It doesn't work. We know that when we remove a cat, more will either more will come, the breeding will continue. It doesn't solve the problem, yet we still do it. And and I know I, I, I irritate some animal control officers when I say this, but it's like, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. You know, but then when you have those agencies that go out, remove the animals, sterilize them and put them back. Then you start seeing populations decline over, through attrition. Then you start seeing it being managed. Then you stop seeing nuisance complaints because the you know the the people who don't want the cats in the yard are taught how to condition the cats not to go in the yard, which is one of the easiest things you can do. It's easier than sit, teaching a dog to sit, um, you know. And and the agencies that are seeing that are like, wow, why haven't we been doing this for decades? When for decades, and I mean decades. You know, we have been doing it the other way and not seeing any results. So I, I think that, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that a lot of these agencies who were resistant to do things like that before are now seeing the, seeing the, 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 the benefits and, and will now move into that as being the new norm. I think everything is going to come out of this as a new norm. Like you said, you know, people helping people, people solving, you know, working together. I think that's going to be the new norm. Yeah, and that's my next question. So what do you see coming? I don't know how accurately we can predict the economy. I mean, who knows what that's going to do to every individual and the ripple effect that we're going to see then to government, to local municipalities. But the next few weeks, months, beyond, what do you think is is headed our way? Well, I'm a little bit of the uh, the optimist, John. I, I, I think we're going to come out of this stronger. I think we are going to come out of this realizing that we're all in this together, um, that whether you are an officer in Baytown, Texas, and, you know, you mentioned you talked to Stephanie. I, I had the I had the pleasure of spending some time with Stephanie. She's a fantastic person, a fantastic officer dedicated to her community. But she has never had the opportunity to interact with anyone from Maine or Washington State, you know, but she now knows that what she deals with on a daily basis is the same thing that an officer in Seattle, Washington is dealing with or or in Miami, Florida. Um, and and we're, we're all in this together. And I think that this is uniting us. And, and I'm proud. I'm really proud that, you know, Best Friends and NACA are, are helping to lead that charge, both with sheltering and animal control that we, we we are uniting so that we can work together, we can solve problems together, we can be that united force. And I do believe in, in every inch of my being that when we come out of this, that we are going to be no different than what I mentioned earlier, that thin blue line. And we are gonna we are gonna have that sense of pride in our job. I mean, I've talked to officers who, you know, they're just like, well, yeah, I'm just, the, I'm just the animal control officer in my city. And it's like, I feel like sometimes I feel like that Marine drill sergeant, you know, stand up straight, hold your head up high. You earn that badge today. You know, hey, buddy, I was in the army and I went through basic <laughs> training. They were not nearly that nice. And there were way more swear words. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, but there are there are offices out there who don't look at themselves. You know, society, uh, the 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 government looks at animal control and all too often as the low man on the totem pole, as the redheaded stepchild of the health department or a program they put under the sheriff's department or wherever the mayor decides to move us this week. And you know, underfunded, understaffed, underappreciated. The community looks at us as dog catchers, and you know, they're just the people that come out and take animals away from people and and and, and all that. But that's not who we are. And, and, and oftentimes officers allow themselves to get beaten down and, 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 and have that self-projection. 
you know, they see themselves in that same light because if everyone's saying it, it must be true. And they don't have the opportunity to interact with someone, you know, someone like me who, you know, I, I, I always say I stand on my animal control soapbox and scream from the rooftops. You know, you earn the right to wear that badge today. No one else would do what you did. Stephanie is a perfect example. I was out with Stephanie, you know, and, and we got a call about two Rottweilers terrorizing the neighborhood. And I don't know if she mentioned this to you or not, um, but her and I went to that call. And they were, they were two big fat marshmallows trying to dig their way back into the fence, you know, into their yard. Uh, they weren't terrorizing the neighborhood. But the point is, we got called by the police to deal with that situation. The police wouldn't deal with it. Fire department wouldn't deal with it. EMS couldn't deal with it. Community couldn't deal with it. The only people that could have dealt with it are the animal control professionals in that community. And the, she and, and I told her, she earned the right to wear her badge today. She should hold her head up high because no one else would have done what she did today. Yeah, it's, um, you said, the, uh, you know, cops and the thin blue line, you know, maybe it is a, a thin orange line or a thin green line, you know, you, this uniting these officers across the country behind this, I think is just really powerful, Scott. And I hope uh, that the, your your goal of making that happen um, happens. And I know you will make it happen. You are a very uh, yeah. resolute man. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I, yeah. it's the little wins uh, Stephanie mentioned and I, I've, the interactions I've had with animal control officers, it, it's true that, you know, changing a water bowl for, for a dog that, you know, maybe needs it. And again, not that there's a particularly, you know, bad ownership situation. It's just, was overlooked or it was the outside bowl or whatever. I mean, just these little things, uh, like you said, that, that you earn the badge. Uh, I, I just don't, the compassion I think that exists within the field, within individual officers. I just don't know, even in our field, Scott, with, I just don't know that people really, really get it. Yeah. And, and, and I think John, it's because when animal control is running around like crazy, trying to, trying to address all their calls that they don't get the opportunity to really show people who they are and what they are. And that's why, like I said earlier, I don't want them to meet the officer. I want them to meet the person, you know? Um, and, 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 you know, that, that same, that same department I was talking to, talking about earlier, that's still out there picking up cats. Um, their director is asking um, if they would start this new program where, you know, if someone doesn't have a way of getting to the shelter, uh, they're quarantined, they don't want to come out in public and all that, but they want to adopt or foster an animal. Um, and, and adoptions and fostering are being done remotely now, and, and, and it's incredible and all that. But they're asking whether or not the officers would be willing to deliver these pets to these people. And the director, you know, kind of said, I don't know about that. What, what, what are your thoughts on that, Scott? I don't know if we, we should be errand boys or not. And, uh, you know, I'm the first one to say animal control shouldn't be errand boys. You know, I mean, any, any officer who sat through any of my workshops knows I say that. But in this case, it gives the, uh, it gives the community the opportunity to see the animal control officers bringing an animal into the community rather than removing it. You know, and if we're only out there responding to emergency calls and, 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 you know, you're going to that one location and you're delivering that animal and, you know, however, however safety precautions you can take to make it happen, I'm in favor of it because it, 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 it shows the animal control officer in a light that they've never been seen before. And that's a good one. You know, and if you think about it, John, the only time people meet animal control is when something negative is happening. Dog got out, dog is barking, neighbors abusing their animal, this, that, or oh, you're abusing your animal. It, it's always, it always has a negative, a negative uh, situation surrounding meeting an ACO. We have to change that. We have to change that. In my opinion, Scott, and I agree with what you said before, we're just, we're seeing the same thing with cops, this community right. policing model and the importance of doing it. You know, if you go back not that far in history, the people in the neighborhood knew the officer yeah. and there was like this relationship that developed and it just wasn't so adversarial like it is today. You know, what we have it just simply isn't working. And as you said earlier, you know, the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Yeah. Scott, listen, man, I appreciate the time and uh, I, I know you're busy, but I know you're also going to find time to go to that corner in your home where you've set that little prayer altar so you can speak to the gods about Tom Brady still showing up 
to, to, <laughs> to training camp in 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 Foxborough and not Tampa. I I really do hope that um he does show up in a Patriots uniform this year but I don't think he will. Um so my next hope is that the Patriots beat Tampa Bay in the Super Bowl. <laughs> well, this has been the podcast Patriots Talk with John and Scott. Seriously man, I appreciate the time and all the work that you're doing uh again to to just move everything we do forward including the work of animal control which uh, deserves the officers deserve it the animals deserve it the community deserves it so I, I just appreciate your work well thank you john and uh, i appreciate the time i'd like to thank the producers of the show tawny hammond amy charlton and mark peralta please take care of yourselves and each other and be safe i'm john dunn and this is the best friends podcast <laughs>